having a massive increase in unemployment. Is filled with people who are critically ill from COVID-19. This is just an unprecedented situation in the United States. I mean, you've got three crises going on at the same time. Vowing to send U.S. troops into the streets of American cities if local authorities don't control the protest. Are you going to allow the government to tell you you have to wear a mask? Increasingly, we Americans occupy alternate universes. There is very little common ground left, only battling perceptions of reality. Escalated into fistfights. Political arguments seem to be taking over social media. You're on social media where simple conversations can go south. Like the growing like hatred towards anybody that's conservative being labeled a Nazi or a white nationalist isn't true. On the streets of Charlottesville today, the hate boiling over white supremacists. One person is dead after a synagogue shooting. Welcome to a thought-provoking conversation among three thought leaders on racism in America. Robin D'Angelo, Ibram Kendi, and Wes Lowry. We have generous support for tonight's program by very forward-thinking corporations like SDG&E, Bank of America, UC San Diego Extension, Rady Children's Hospital, San Diego Union Tribune, the University of San Diego, KPBS, Warwick's, and the Indigent Criminal Defense Fund. We're also so grateful for our very generous host committee. Wes Lowry is a best-selling author and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist for his investigation following the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He's with us to facilitate the conversation with America's two number one best-selling authors on racism, Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo. Welcome, Wes. Thank you so much for that introduction, Chris. And thank you everyone who worked hard to make this event possible and everyone who's tuning in today. We're gonna have a really great conversation. My name is Wesley Lowry. I'm a uh, reporter and author with uh, CBS News, and I'm excited to have what I think is going to be a really smart conversation today about this moment we are living in, as well as the ideas of racism and anti-racism. And I've got with me two of the leading scholars in this space, folks whose work you've probably interacted with and who you may have questions for. I know I do as well. Uh, and so let me briefly introduce uh, Ibram Kendi and Robin D'Angelo. Uh, you've seen their books all over the New York Times bestseller list uh, recently, and you've also seen them talking about this idea of anti-racism. Now, one term, and, and I think I, I certainly used it already, I'm sure both of you will, um, that we're seeing discussed a lot right now is this idea of what does it mean to be an anti-racist, what is anti-racism, right? And that is a term that in the broad national conversation is relatively new, even if it's one that has roots and has been being used historically. One might argue that you, you two are among the scholars helping define that. How do each of you define the term anti-racism um, or anti-racist activity? What does that mean and how does that relate to the conversation we're having now? Sure, so I, you know, I would say that we, we have racial inequity and injustice in our society and to be anti-racist is to look out at, at this racial inequity and not see what's wrong with black people, not see what's wrong with native or Latinx immigrants. To be anti-racist is to recognize the racial groups despite any differences as equals. And so when you have thereby racial inequity and injustice, and you believe that the racial groups in, is, are equals, the only other explanation is an explanation that racist policies, that, 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 that racist structures, that racist power is behind these racial inequities. And so there then to be anti-racist is to then challenge these policies, to, to challenge this, this power, to create more, more equitable uh, policies, to, to create um, policies, I should say, enact policies that lead to sort of equal opportunity and, 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 and justice for all. So to be anti-racist is also to be willing to admit the times in which 
we are being racist to to you know for white people to use Robin's terms to not be so fragile um, and to have the ability to admit when we're being racist. And so while someone who's being racist always denies it and indeed says they're the least racist person anywhere in the world. Yeah, I mean, racism is the foundation of our society, of our country, of our institutions. By every measure, racial inequality is reproduced. Uh, our schools are particularly effective at reproducing racial inequality. And that means that racism is not an aberration, it's actually the norm. Right? And in a society in which racism is the norm, to not actively seek to interrupt it is to uh, collude with it uh, by default. You know, as a white person, I move through a society in which racism is the norm in racial comfort. I mean, just, just take that in for a moment. I am comfortable in a racist society as a white person. And so, Com racial comfort in a, in a sense is a sign of racism uh, in a society that keeps reproducing these outcomes. And so putting anti makes it active. If, if you are not actively challenging that status quo, you are participating in the status quo. And it really changes the conversation for me as a white person from if I'm racist, to which most white people will answer no. And if my answer is no, what further uh, action is required of me? Well, none, I'm not racist. But when you understand that it is the default, uh, you change that question to how. How have I been shaped by this system? Um, and how might I be colluding with it? And that puts me on a lifelong uh, trajectory of strategic intentional action. Now, one of the things that the NCRC focuses on and talks about is the importance of all voices and different types of voices being included in these types of conversations, right? There is, we're in a moment where we are talking about, right, how do we center certain types of experiences in a, in a world where perhaps you have white audiences grappling with uh, their own complicity in a system or, or trying to, to figure out what their role is in this type of conversation. How do you think folks should sort through that? How do we have uh, conversations that acknowledge the differences and experiences that people have, but that also uh, don't, you know, systemically silence certain types of voices. You know, how should different types of people uh, who are coming to this conversation with different backgrounds and different experiences, how should they think about their role in this big conversation, especially at a time where you, you do have people out there who are concerned that if they say the wrong thing, they'll get shouted down or canceled or run out of town. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it speaks to this framework of either or, right? You either are racist or you are not. These are fixed categories in a lot of people's minds. And if you're not racist, you're a good person. And if you're racist, you're a bad person. So even the fear, what if I say something racist, therefore I won't say anything at all. I mean, well, that's one way to go about it. I, I would want to know. And, and that's the question I would offer. Do you want to know if you are inadvertently reinforcing a racist ideology or assumption? Would you not want to be open to receiving that feedback? Um, it, that engenders curiosity and humility. And again, just, just being open to taking a look at this. I don't think we can get there from the current paradigm that, that is, is a very simple formula of either or. Yeah, and, and, and I also think that people have to realize that, that to be raised in the United States and in many other countries is to be raised to think that there's something wrong with, with darker people, in this case, black and, and brown and indigenous people. And so that then becomes the norm. Like, and many people don't even know that, that they are drenched with racist ideas because they've been taught their whole life that they're dry. And, and, and so I think if, if, if people realize that, and then I think if people also realize that people taught them to think that way, that people were producing, mass producing these racist ideas, they, they don't have to look far to a current set of political rhetoric that, that says to white working class people, the reason why you're struggling economically 
is not because of our country's economic policies that are being put in place by the very politicians you're voting for, but the reason why you're struggling economically is because those brown people who are apparently taking your jobs, because those black people. So you have so many people who are struggling who are then taught that the source of their pain are other people who don't look like them. And, and so I, I just think that it's critically important for people to realize that people weren't born racist, they were made racist. And, and they were made racist so they can spend their time going after other people as opposed to the true source you know, of, 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 of the pain of many Americans, particularly many Americans of color. And, and I, so I talk about, I, I, you know, I sort of, many, many Black folks know uh, this famous sort of speech when, when Malcolm X was talking to, to Black folks and saying, you've been had, you've been led astray, you've been hoodwinked. But I think it's important for white Americans to realize they've been had, they've been hoodwinked, they've been led astray. And they're certainly being led astray by their, by their politicians today. Ibram, do you think, you know, what role does history and our knowledge of our own history and the way we teach our history to ourselves play, play in this, right? That we all live here in the same country, but at times have vastly different understandings of how we've gotten to today. Um, and different interpretations even of the things that have happened in our history. Uh, we're seeing this play out across the country um, in part in response to the New York Times 1619 project and conversations about how do we teach issues of history. We've always had, had disputes over history. How does that factor in to our ability to have this conversation? I mean, if you were taught as a child and certainly even as an adult, that the founding fathers, to say nothing of the women at the time, inherited slavery. And then, you know, spent a few decades fighting against it and then realized completely that it was wrong. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Then all rights were provided to, to, to black people. Um, and then there were a few wayward Southern whites who, who went astray and, and created Jim Crow, but that was righted in the 60s. And now there's equal e opportunity and equal equality. And then you look out at Black people demonstrating on the streets against racism, you're going to be like, why are they demonstrating on the streets? Everything is cool here. You know, we progressed. There's equal opportunity. Yes, there was slavery, but that's over. Yes, there was Jim Crow, but that's over. We've righted our wrongs. So why are you demonstrating? Why are you angry? And if you've been taught that, that what's actually happened over the last 50 years is white people have been subjected to discrimination, reverse discrimination and racism, then you're not only going to be confused, you're gonna be angry because you're gonna think that you're the source of discrimination when even though if you're white, you're typically, white people are on the higher end of almost every racial disparity. And so that's how, that's why history and your perception and recognition, uh, you know, of history and how we got to this point is absolutely sort of critical. And, and so many people have been misled into believing that false history of steady and continuous and perfect and beautiful racial progress and everything sort of came together in the 60s or came together when one Black man stepped into one house. Mm -hmm. Robert, you know, one thing that comes up in these conversations is people, uh, critics would argue, right, that what was just laid out or this conversation means that America is hopelessly racist, right? That, that this is saying that we are bad people and have always been, been bad people and always will be bad people. How would you respond to that framing that we often hear in response to this type of conversation? You're saying America's hopelessly racist and all the white people are hopelessly racist. What do we do? You know, well, I, I couldn't do the work I do if I thought it was hopeless. I, mm -hmm. I don't think it will likely end in my lifetime. Uh, it's a highly adaptive system, but uh, it is not hopeless. And I, um, there's a question that just never fails me, uh, and that is, how does that function, right? Not, not necessarily is this true or false or right or wrong, 
but how does it function to say that it's hopeless? And if we talk about this, it's just making us feel hopeless. So let's not talk about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I can't think of any other social problem that we would say the best approach to that social problem is never to speak of it. Right, a suicide, a sexual assault, eating disorders, uh, you know, depression. Let's not talk about those things. I think we know quite well that we do need to talk about them. If you can't see a problem, you can't address the problem. Uh, yes, uh, it's it can be discouraging, uh, but we can also look a lot around right now and see some pretty incredible symbolic changes, at least, um, that make a difference. So hopelessness. Uh, does not serve us. And neither does guilt, by the way. And since you, you didn't bring it up, but you might. <laughs> I, I want to be really clear that I am just not interested in guilt in any way. It's not constructive or useful. Um, I think that some guilt for white people in coming to awareness of this reality is a natural response, but we absolutely must move through that or it just functions to excuse our immobility, right? I did not choose to be filled with racist ideology, uh, but I was. And so um, I don't feel guilty about it. I feel responsible for the outcome in my life. Right. So what is this looking like in my daily life and what could I do to interrupt that or to change that? Well, I think that question I want to ask is what is the role and responsibility of the average American, the average person, the person tuning in today? Right. If, if they say, look, I agree with basically everything you guys have said so far. Right. Yes, uh, there was racism kind of baked into the society and structure. It's trickled down generation over generation. It propels these disparities in our society. And I would prefer that not to be the case. What is the responsibility then of the individual who subscribes to kind of this historical narrative that, that we've talked about, about how we got to where we are today? So I would say ascribing to it without in actively interrupting it, it is basically meaningless. Um, uh, it reminds me of people who read a book or take a class and then end by saying, I'm going to continue to think about this. <laughs> and I always want to ask, and how will people of color know you continue to think about this? Like, if it doesn't manifest in some kind of action, it is functionally meaningless. No, I agree. And, and, and I also think what, what every sort of person can do, if, if they recognize racial inequities and disparities in their community, in their institution, and they even may even recognize the actual policies behind those inequities, chances are there's someone in their institution, there's some group in their community that's fighting against that racism. And, and so what can they do? They can join that organization. They can join with those people. They can donate to that organization. Um, they could provide their expertise in some way to the, that organized body of people, because that's what we need. We need organized groups of people. We need organizations that are challenging racism, whether it's organized groups of researchers, whether it's organized group of activists, we need to be investigating racism. We need to be figuring out the policies that are behind it. We need to be proposing and pushing for policy changes. We need to be shifting the narrative that people are the problem as opposed to, be, as opposed to power. And we need to be utilizing our power to force or institute sort of policy sort of change. And, and, and there's a role for every single human uh, every single American in that struggle at, at the local level, if not the national and international level. What are some of the ways that our nation's historical legacy and decisions as it relates to race and racism still manifest in the world in which we live? I'm going to defer to Ibram based on that beautiful book of yours, Stamp from the Beginning. You probably have at your fingertips. <laughs> I mean, something as simple as, you know, when, when Black people were enslaved in this country for, for hundreds of years, it was a crime for us to run away. It, it was a crime for Black people to organize or join a slave revolt. It was a crime for a starving enslaved Black person 
to take food from an overstocked pantry. And, and so what, what happened was to be human and black during enslavement, if we understand the, the a basic desire to be human is the desire to be free was criminalized. And so during the enslavement era, this, there was this obvious sort of connection between blackness and, and criminality. And, and black criminality almost became the same sort of term and the same word. And people at the time were fearful of black people because they knew these people were human and they were trying to resist and decided that they were not going to free them. But that fear of black people persisted and it persists to this day in which you have black, you have black and white and, and Latinx and you have police officers um, who fear black bodies and who are actually fearing unarmed black bodies more than they fear armed white people. And, and then they're using their power uh, to claim after they shoot and kill unarmed black people that they fear for their life. And in many cases, they're getting off in the way slaveholders consistently got off when they would terrorize and brutalize and, and, and kill black bodies. And how does that relate to the, you linked that to the uh, policing system. How, how does our prison system and our conceptualization of the prison system factor into those legacies as well? Well, I mean, it's in, in many ways, the, the police officer became the master, right? The jail cell became the plantation. And it was, it was still believed during even the Civil War, you had many Northerners and Western whites who were fearful that Black people would go free because they thought that black, free Black people would run ranchot all over the country and just, you know, uh, riot and, and rape. And what's fascinating is you talk to Americans now who are completely against any defunding of the police or even abolishing the police. Their fear, again, is these Black people will go, will run ramshot and Latinx people will run ramshot all over this country and that that all of those people who are incarcerated right now are incarcerated because they're dangerous, hardened criminals. And if we decarcerate, then we're going to flood the nation with all these uh, hoodlums. These are fallacies. And, and, and th these were the same fallacies that Americans had during the Civil War. And, and what actually happened after the Civil War, it wasn't Black people running ramshot and raping and rioting and, and killing returning Confederate white soldiers who did that in the South. And so what does this look like to combat as an individual today, right? Where does that obligation fall? I know even when you talked earlier about finding these finding these organizations, getting involved in them. And what are also the role of our institutions? What does a school do? What does a, you know, like how do we interact with the world that we live in here? If the goal is to dismantle uh, racist systems. You know, the thought that I had on that question was um, in, in terms of examples of structural racism, is the school system. I, I don't know that you could have designed that more efficiently to reproduce inequality than the way that we fund schools, uh, uh, testing, tracking, that many of these mechanisms are not at all useful, but they do serve to elevate some children over others. And so one of the things each of us can do is really ask ourselves deeply, why do I believe my children should have the best of everything? And does that depend on somebody else's children not having the best of everything? So this idea that it's okay if schools are unequal as long as my child is in the best school, that white middle-class and upper-class parents are often the number one barrier to the kind of equality that could change schools that could interrupt the school to prison pipeline and so on. So what each of us can do is a kind of that relationship between a deep look 
at what we think we need and deserve and what we're willing to get involved in to open things up so that everybody has a quality education. So get involved in those local schools. Uh, if you don't think it is a good school, then get involved to change that rather than move away and you know get as far from that school as possible so that your child can have something better. It's, that's the kind of investment we have to be willing to make. Now, a lot of people right now are talking about issues of race, about race in America. A lot of people who are otherwise uncomfortable with these ideas. Um, how or what advice would you give to someone who has been moved over the last few months by what they have seen on television, videos of police shootings, the protests, their neighbors outside? They've, maybe they've been listening to folks who say they're, that they feel uncomfortable, they feel unsafe. And, what would you say to someone who is not necessarily used to talking about these issues or these topics, but who wants to, who wants to be involved in this conversation? How do they enter these conversations? How do they conduct themselves in that space? How do they avoid it all going left and sideways like maybe it did on Thanksgiving a few years ago? And you know, what does it look like for folks who, unlike the three of us, don't spend all of their time talking and thinking about these issues? Uh, well, practice definitely makes a difference. <laughs> um, that kind of breathe, slow down, have the have some humility, particularly if you are white. Just start from the premise that you are going to have blind spots. Uh, be open to having other people help you see that. Don't think about making mistakes as the the worst thing that could possibly happen. If you think that I am articulate on these issues, it's from years of thousands of mistakes. The key is that you learn and you grow from those mistakes. You don't use them as your excuse to refuse any further engagement. You know, when you are sincere uh, and open, people can sense that in you and, and are willing to work with you. So would you add to that even? <laughs> I mean, I would agree. I mean, I, it's 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 amazing. I, you know, people say to me, "Oh, you're articulate," and I'm like, I don't. First of all, I don't think I'm that articulate. I feel like I have so much more to learn and so much um, room to grow. But I certainly have grown over the years, as, as as Robin said, from from constant sort of honing. And 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 I think that the more we put ourselves in an uncomfortable place or space for anything, the, the more over time we'll get used to that discomfort or even on some level, it may become a little more, more comfortable. And, but we have to start somewhere. We have to start in that discomfort. And that's not just for when it comes to talking about racism. That's, I would say, for almost anything. And so I think if we reflect back to any type of uh, thing we were, scared to talk about or any type of injustice we were scared to to join the fight about um you know the more we did it the the more effective we were um the more we were able to sort of sit and control our discomfort it's the same thing with being anti-racist now how do institutions a college for example how do they balance or consider their varying needs right so when i think about college campus i think about they're in some ways competing uh, values or priorities that, you know, first and foremost, the safety and education of all of their people. But second, the fact that they do want to theoretically create a space for debate and back and forth and bringing in things that are unpopular purely for exposure purposes or to be encountered. How do institutions think about that? What does that look like once we're no longer talking about the individual, but start aggregating up? Uh, because so much of our conversation nationally is about who has a right to these tables, to these conversations, who should be in certain spaces, how we figure out, you know, what does that look like? Well, I mean, I would, I would say that when you're talking about institutions and, you know, we should be thinking about what are the policies governing those institutions? Are they leading to inequity or equity? The policymakers are they defending racist or anti-racist uh, policies? Does the institution have a culture of, of of racist ideas that say that the reason why 
black and brown people are underrepresented here is because they don't want to come here is because they're unqualified is is because they they they're lazy is because there's something wrong with them um or does the institution have a a culture of anti-racist ideas which is how can we transform ourselves what are we doing wrong you know as opposed to what are these people um you know, doing wrong. And, and I think that's absolutely critical. I, I know when it comes to the college campus and even the whole sort of wanting to nurture free speech, I have no problem nurturing free speech, but I don't think any college campus should be nurturing lies. And so we can speak from the standpoint of facts. We can argue over facts. We can argue over the reasons why um, the, the globe is warming but we should not be arguing whether the globe is warming. You know, we can argue over why black people are more likely to be killed by police, but we shouldn't be arguing if black people are, are more likely to be killed by police. You know, and, and, and I think oftentimes you have people who are basically lying, who have not proven their theories, um, who are purporting misleading data and then when we don't want to engage them, they're saying we're taking away their free speech. No, we're taking away your ability to lie. Yeah, I mean, any class you take, you have to grapple with a framework. Uh, and, you know, whether you agree or disagree is not as not really that relevant. Do you understand these concepts? Can you demonstrate an understanding of these concepts? Uh, we're not. Uh, debating the uh, truth of the concepts. And I, I actually think that in 2020, if you are a professor and you cannot engage with some nuance and complexity in these issues, if you cannot facilitate these conversations in the classroom, you're actually not qualified to be teaching in the classroom in 2020. And I think if institutions actually looked at this, some kind of critical uh, racial awareness and skill as qualification, that would very much begin institutional change and policy change. Well, and that speaks to another question that comes up very often, which is what is the individual's obligation to do this work, to do this research, to know what they're talking about <laughs> as we enter in these conversations? Um, because very often there's a conversation about whether or not too much of that work is like getting offloaded, be it to the experts or the talking head in this space or your black friend who you text about this, right? How does the average person equip themselves to be a participant in this part of our democracy? Well, I think it's the job of the institution first and foremost, particularly if we do, or if we are beginning a period of transition in which, and I would hope on the other side of that transition, that the individual doesn't need an incentive to engage in these issues, to have racial literacy. But I think what Robin was speaking to is that in, in a way we have to create an incentive and even a qualification as she stated to be anti-racist, right? You know, for every single person. So, so that the institution is not essentially putting, let's say the, the diversity work unpaid diversity work on the shoulders of every person of color and then having to constantly, you know, bring in outside folks um, who, who are essentially battling the, the current sort of uh, people in power as well as even the majority of workers. You know, I think that institutions should, should, if they truly do value uh, workers who are committed to equity, uh, who are committed to anti-racism, then they would they would provide an incentive. That's what they do for everything else that they value. So, so why wouldn't they do that for this? Now, how do you all see our, our politics and our media interacting with these conversations? Not in terms of specific politicians or people, but rather in terms of how these conversations pop up when we discuss these issues, the cycle with which we discuss them. Minneapolis is on the news for a week or so until until the next thing's on the news. And 
How, and do you think there's any role uh, in the institution of media in terms of the reasons that this work sometimes feels either stalled or that it falls out of the conversation? Yeah, I mean, it might be naive of me, but I, I really was taken aback by how powerful the media is in terms of where it directs our attention, right? And there was this period where it was just everywhere. I went into the grocery store and there were Black, li uh, Black Lives Matter signs over the cheese uh, case, right? Um, it was just absolutely everywhere. Uh, and then it moves away. So what I would say is, um, and it speaks to a question you asked earlier, how people who are new to this conversation stay involved, that when those cameras go away, it gets hard again. This, uh, this is a deeply protected system uh, and it doesn't give up easily as we can see. And if you don't put support around you to keep your attention there, particularly if you are white, uh, you are likely going to just get seduced back into the status quo. Um, so the media is absolutely critical in this. And I wouldn't say that they're different from any other uh, person or institution. Of course, people make up institutions. <laughs> um, and uh, they have a responsibility to keep this uh, front and center. No, I agree. And, and I, I think especially the, the media. So, you know, journalists and even are are essentially experts with words, or they're supposed to be experts with words, whether written or, or, or oral. And and I, I'm saying this to say that, you know, it's critically important for journalists to use words like racist and anti-racist when they apply and, and, and not be ashamed about it, not consider it to be a political statement when you say that someone who said Black people are lazy are being racist, just as when, when, when a journalist says, yes, when that politician, you know, punched somebody, he was angry. You're angry, you know, we, we all know what it means to be angry, just as, you know, a journalist should know what it means to be racist. And, and it's a descriptive term. It describes when a person is connoting racial hierarchy or supporting policies that are leading to inequity. And if journalists do not have the ability, do not have even the courage to use the words in the dictionary that allow us to talk about race and racism, then who's gonna do it? We invite you to join us again to continue what we started tonight. Listening is the first step. Now is the time to act. Join us in a path forward. There are a few ways you can do this. Sign up for our signature training, The Art of Inclusive Communication. Enroll in the Bystander Challenge and anti-harassment training, or ask us about our training for your company or community organization, or participate in a community restorative dialogue circle. All of this information can be found on our website at ncrconline.com. The National Conflict Resolution Center honored the late Congressman John Lewis with the National Peacemaker Award in 2014. It was such a powerful evening, and we miss him dearly and only wish he could be with us here tonight. His loss is so profound. So in closing, we'd like to honor him with a passage he wrote that was published on the day of his funeral. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence, is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. For the National Conflict Resolution Center, I'm Steve Dinkin. Thank you and good night.